and welcome to another week of 72 Pin Connector. With us today, we have Adam Jordan. Hey! Tom Webster. <laughs> Yo! And myself, Eric Fine. How are you guys doing this evening? Not too bad. Pretty good, pretty good. How are you doing? A lot better than I thought. Found out, out here in Se- found out out here in Seattle, they do not know how to deal with snow. You get oh. a quarter of an inch of snow... <laughs> Schools are closed. No one is out driving. It was beautiful wow. because my normal hour, hour 15 commute was like 45 minutes. It was beautiful. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but it's just amazing to see how much they shut down. Yeah. How oh, yeah. Snow. Coming in as an Ohioan, you're just like, oh, what? This, this is nothing. Quarter yeah. inch. Let me show you how it's done. <laughs> well, it's funny because you have me from Ohio. My skip level manager is from um, Chicago. My um, one guy's from Rhode Island, other one from Russia. I mean, everyone on the team oh, knows Jesus. how to deal with snow, and we're <laughs> here in freaking Seattle, and no one knows how to deal with fucking snow. It's amazing. <laughs> the Russian guy in the work is like, ah, oh, quarter inch. You guys are having a really warm summer out here, aren't you? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, freaking crazy. Uh, so, what you, you guys been able to get into many games this week? No, no, I haven't. No, no. Uh, okay, one, just one. Um, guess. And, and I think I know. If, <laughs> if anyone <laughs> has paid attention to the podcast, um, I, I played Doom, uh, and honestly, I only played Doom for a, probably a total of like four hours this week. Um, I am still as much in love with the game as I was before, probably even a little bit more so just because there are little secrets to find. There's uh, a lot of cool stuff to pay attention to um, stuff. I didn't even know was, um, you know, was hidden in the game I found. Uh, so, but other than that, it's just been a crazy busy week full of work stuff and other stuff. So that is literally the only thing I've been playing. Nice. You, uh, what have you been playing Eric. I've been actually busy with a lot of different stuff. Um, doing Pokemon, still running through that um, to the point where I've completed all of their gems or what they call gems. And it's just down to filling the Pokedex right now is what I'm working on. So the long nice. grind of doing that. Because I think <laughs> it's up to 800 and some Pokemon in the games. Good oh, God. Wow. Yeah, I didn't this, realize they've gotten that, that many more. Yeah. Th- well, this, game's, this game itself doesn't technically contain that many. Mm-hmm. But through trading, you can still get all of those. Okay, I see. So I've been playing nice. some of that. Standard Rocket League, Speedrunners. Uh, yeah. Free Titanfall last weekend, like we said. So um, I know Adam and I jumped in a little bit of that. Tried that out. Yeah, yeah, it um, was good. So I don't know the player base on consoles. I will say that game is a very good game that is suffering because of player base. And it's yeah. very sad because that is a really good. I thought it was a really well done shooter from what mm-hmm. little we played. That is too bad. Um, a little VR with climbing. I don't know if you guys have seen that before. No. So, um, climbing is a mountain climbing VR game. It's um, done by I think, the same people who did Job Simulator. It's, um, it's really fun. Uh, there's a co-op mode where you can kind of help each other climb, have time races and stuff. It's it's really fun, but it's disorienting when you fall. It's the first mm-hmm. VR game that actually got me a little queasy. Oh, wow. Yeah, I couldn't imagine that that type of locomotion would be, you know, very good or very comfortable. Because how does it do it? Like, if you grab a ledge and you pull to, like, move the camera? Yeah, but you actually have to pull. As you pull your arms... It'll move your head accordingly. So the climbing yeah. motion works. It's they have a jumping mechanic. Mm-hmm. Oh. It, when you just fall, when you fucking fall, that gets. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. Yeah, I played for about 45 minutes straight, and then I sat down, and that's when it hit me, dude. Your stomach's in a knot right now. Yeah, I uh, I remember looking at trailers for uh, a game called I think it was Windlands. Uh, it's sort of like a, a VR platformer almost, uh, and it just it, it did not look like anything fun. And the number one complaint about the game was they said, "Yeah, if you get even you know slightly motion sick when VR really messes with you, this game will just aggravate that." 
So I, I took that off my list. <laughs> yeah, I've done a lot of VR. This is the first time something's actually gotten to me. So I imagine platforming type games, unless they do some really creative stuff, you're probably going to have this issue. Yeah. Yeah. And then one last game I played was the uh, big release of the week. Um, I got The Last Guardian and I ran probably about two hours of it. Nice. Planning How is it? it this weekend. It's so, from what I've played so far and what I've been hearing from other review sources, I like the game. The game is fun. This game is not, so far, it's not something, oh my God, you have to have this. Mm-hmm. No, it's not Ico. It's, uh, it's not Ico. But the dog, cat, bird thing. Trico. <laughs> its name is Trico, so I don't have to keep saying that. Trico. But um, they did a really good job with it. Uh, they kind of gave it its own mind, its own AI. And it's not a pure problem solving AI to where it automatically gets where you need to do, do this. It kind of has its own thing it does. Hmm. It gets distracted. Like I'm in this spot where I have to get him around this pillar and get him to help me through this next section. And he's just kind of drifting off, looking at the water off this cliff. It's like, come on, get your fucking ass over here, dog. <laughs> um, visually, it's very good. But there's one thing I noticed, and a lot of places I've heard talked about it. They have frame rate drops every once in a while at the beginning part of the game. Like, we're talking, it dips into single-digit frame rate. Ooh. Ooh. It's for a very short stint. It was really surprising. Nothing intense was happening. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, this is running like dog shit. And then all of a sudden, bam, okay, Ooh. everything's good. Weird. So all in all, so far, per- so good. But um, I should be able to tell you all about it next week. But so far, I think Trico is going to be what makes the game and the way he interacts. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what made Ico so, so wonderful is not, not really the, the gameplay. Because the gameplay itself, I mean, to be real, is, is fairly forgettable. Uh, you run around, you climb stuff, and you you swing wildly at shadow monsters. It's it's the relationship between the two main characters and how that grows over the course of a game. It feels really organic. Yeah, the one thing I will say also that wasn't organic was also the way you move and uh, camera angles. I never personally played Shadow of Colossus, but I what I've heard oh, really? is kind of similar to where it's a um, I, a clunky. I guess is the word I'm thinking. Where yeah. the, the moving, it doesn't feel like you're used to. It is very yeah. fluid, but it's when you're it's running. F- fluid, but not responsive. Yes. That maybe. Okay. Yes, that, that's <laughs> exactly like what I'm going for. Rounded like in reality. If yeah. I can say that. Ico in, in Shadow of the Colossus had the same thing where it wasn't. Yeah. It didn't feel like you were playing a standard third person action game. It, was, it definitely had some, uh, some play to mm-hmm. it and yeah. i was watching you play that a little bit on when you streamed it and that's they all play like that exactly i mean it, it immediately i was like oh that looks like a ico shadow of the colossus kind of thing seriously though you have to get so you have to get the shadow of the colossus hd remix yeah. thing i it's have it eric you so can borrow good. it so good that was when you're PS3, in town right you can take it with you <laughs> yeah ps3 yeah I've been thinking about getting that, but enough about what I've been playing. Adam, have you been into anything interesting this week? I have actually. Oh really? Um, I, yeah. Tell. Oh, uh, oh, I play Rocket League like I always do. <laughs> but, 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 that's it. That's all I ever do. <laughs> that's a big part of it because of the update. But um, we'll get to that in a minute. Oh yeah. But I downloaded. I downloaded the demo for Inside. So Inside oh, has a playable demo on Steam. Oh, how is that? Because that, that brought home from the some makers awards. from from the makers of Limbo. I didn't get that far into it, but I did play it a little bit. And you can definitely tell it was from the makers of Limbo. Very, very similar style. But it looks like it could have like a, a neat world story situation thing to figure out. <laughs> it, it, it was intriguing. I, I, I liked the style. The style is cool. Is the art in the same way where it's kind of a dark art style? Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot like that. I, I love their usage of uh, background, foreground, and 
whatever where your guy's standing. I, I love their usage of that. It's it's very artsy. Yeah, I remember. Is my- it kind of creepy? Is it as disturbing as Limbo, where you know you take the wrong turn or do the wrong thing, and you know the the cute little boy gets like stabbed through the heart by a giant spider creature? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All within right. the fr- within the first minute of the demo, you're running from people, and if you get to a certain part, they will shoot you right there, or the guy will drown you into the lake or whatever. I but never God. played. It's, I never played yeah. through Limbo, but what you just described, uh-huh. Tom, stuck with me forever. Because yeah. that, that spider just blends in so well yeah. <laughs> to the background. You think it's a tree, and then, boom, impaled. Yeah. And then, oh, my God. So, oh, Jesus. Fucking Limbo. <laughs> and then, so, if you, I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't played Limbo. But, guys, if, if you saw that game or if you played through the game with the spider and then the leg and then the rolling, I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Good God. Yeah, Inside seems really cool. There's a playable demo. I would recommend checking it out. It's just the beginning part of the game. I'm I'm not sure how far into the game it gets, but I will download it. Oh yeah, right I'm gonna I'm gonna finish it for sure. I'll I'll be getting back down to that for sure. More games so need that. to do that. Yeah, yeah. We need more demos. So well, played that. It's... Played a little bit of the Titanfall two. That was pretty cool. Um, I played a little bit of. This is a game I bought a long time ago, and I played a little bit. I didn't get all the way through it, but 140. And it kind of relates to our group topic later, but it's um, a music rhythm based platformer. Come again? Yes, a music and rhythm based platformer. So oh. you basically you find a little, you get to the little orbs in the thing and take it back to the, the save point area and then it changes things. You do level two, blah, 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 blah. But um, everything in the environment that's moving is moving to the music. Hmm. So you have to use the timing of the music that's playing in the background. And then every time you get one of those orbs and bring it back to the receptacle thing, it adds another element of music to the soundtrack and it builds on itself. And then something, Ooh. and then more things start moving and it gets harder. It's, it's really cool. And I, I wanna, fantastic. Yeah. I think it's really cheap too. It's just like a little tiny indie game. You could probably play through it in like an hour. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Is it a type of game where it's a different playthrough every time based on the music, or is it a Mm-mm. set piece music? No, it's set piece thing, same song every time. Uh, yeah. Because when you were saying That's that, cool. I was thinking something like Audio Surfer, where it adapts to your music. Oh. I'm like, oh, that would be cool as fuck. No, not exactly. It would be hard to structure a level around that, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it would have to be like a roguelike where they build it off of the music, which would yeah. be intense. Yeah. <laughs> It's just a little small game, a little indie game, but it's worth it's worth checking out. I think it's cheap. It's always cheap. I think I got it on sale for like a couple bucks or something. So nice. So I played that, and then obviously Rocket League, the new update. New update is really good, by the way. Yes. So, um, what do you? A lot th- of quality of life improvements. So I have to ask, what do you think of Hex, or what do they call it? The Octagon. Starbase. Starbase. Arc. Starbase Arc. That's what yes. it is. It's good. I like it a lot. The I only lo- thing I don't like about it is that uh, it could use a little more contrast. Coloring because, wise? Yeah. Like the whole floor is a little too close to colors of the ball. So if the ball is far away, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell where it is and what it's doing. I'm l- for those- the, the map is beautiful. It's really cool. It's fun to play on. And how could you have any complaints about Rocket League in yes. space? <laughs> they have a really cool goal um, animation where the guns behind the goal start firing lasers off mm-hmm. into space, like Space Invader style. Nice. Yeah. But they added a lot of little stuff. Like there's more uh, when you're doing your control bindings. Now there's bindings for like dodge left, dodge right, dodge forward, dodge backwards. Ooh. There's. Um, they added you can adjust the dead zone of your analog stick in the settings. Oh, that's nice! Wow, they're yeah. getting into some pro level stuff with this. Yeah, <laughs> they want to be sound heavy on the pro scene. So, well, a lot of people adjusted their dead zones anyway. So it's kind of cool yeah. that they put that in the game. Uh, the, the training thing is awesome. People can upload training things. Basically, you can make a training and it'll create a code, and then you can share that code with other people, and they can play your training. So you set up nice. the ball launcher thing, and it'll show you where the ball's going to go, and you can set up shots for yourself to practice on. It's, I always like to see when the community helps shape the game, mm-hmm. where they see the community keeps doing this and this. Why don't we put the tool in the game? Yep. So yep. And then the Steam Workshop support, which was also incredible. So there's maps you can download and play. It's just maps so far. 
but um yeah you go to the the extras tab in the main menu you go to steam workshop you pick the one you want and you install it and you can get to it it's right there you don't have to restart the game you don't have to move any folders around now how's how's that gonna work with consoles they just don't get to play on those maps right no it, no it's not like a it's not like a play with other people on those maps it's like there's an obstacle course one somebody made oh okay that kind of stuff i can see so it's like multiplayer maps i could see them doing what bungie did though after four or a uh, halo three with forge the player or the community can make maps after about a year they said okay it's time they put in grab bag which was nothing but well actually they put in something before grab bag that was just maps community made but grab bag took the game types and everything that the community made and put whole community made games in a playlist for everyone to be able to play together hmm. so if they get to that point that would be able to include the um consoles because they could push it as an update and actually add it to content of the game oh, so uh cool. I've, I've got a slightly related question do you guys remember when we used to buy map packs on discs <laughs> Are you referring directly to Halo 2? Yes, I am. I'm not going to lie. Is that the only DLC that ever started as a physical media? Uh, I don't. I, it can't be the only one. It can't be the only one. Because mm-hmm. that, ga- I, that game did nothing unless you had Halo 2. Nothing. Yeah. Yep. It literally was used to install the games to the original Xbox and or 360. Yeah. Which was also no, really cool because you, anyone could use it. One person bought it, everyone could use it. <laughs> so yeah, that's about all I've been playing. Yeah, so the week has been a little light for the games for Tom, but I think Tom had a little bit of Dota 2 on his plate with uh, Boston Major going on. Yes, yes. So uh, I haven't caught very much of it, uh, but from what I've seen, it has been a good Major um, not as much of a crazy upset as this most recent TI, uh, but there are some new players that are still uh, in the rounds today. Now, I, I'm going to avoid spoilers, so if you do like Dota um, and you haven't kept up with it, uh, I will not spoil anything here. Uh, just know that Valve is, again, um, just like with TI, they're, they're doing really well the production value. Uh, really well on you know the the pro scene, the interviews, uh, just you know bringing the hype as usual. Uh, in addition to that, they did announce the location of the next Dota Two major. It will be in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, so you know, home to uh, to Navi. Uh, one the uh, I want to say they won Ti Two. It was TI, the first no, one. TI1. It was the first TI1. one. one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, hopefully Navi can come back and, uh, and start kicking more ass like they used to. But well, just, I, I can dream. I can dream, damn it. It just blows my mind that they're willing to go to Ukraine, given the state of the what's. Well, I mean, a, we don't hear about it as much, but there's still a lot of stuff going on in Ukraine right now. Yeah. And to put something. Well, I know this isn't Super Bowl. This isn't even pro basketball level, but. To put something on that scale in that country, I wonder if they're going to possibly have teams that don't travel. Um, I don't think so. I mean, most of that stuff, I, mean, I don't want to turn this into like a, a political newscast, but most of that stuff is pretty calmed down at this point. Uh, it's kind of, you know, sectioned off into its own little area and, and it's not it's not as hot as it was before. So you got any uh, predictions for the rest? Uh, I don't want to get into predictions because I don't want to spoil anything, but I, I'm really pulling for OG because they, they were who I was rooting for in, uh, uh, in TI and, you know, they, they they did, they did get knocked out of the international, but they played a hell of a tournament and, uh, and I'm pulling for them again this time. And, uh, Dota two wasn't the only big tournament going on. Um, Rocket League actually had its biggest tournament of all time to date occur last weekend. I think Adam has a little bit of information on that guy. Oh, yeah. I sat down and watched the whole thing. Every match? I watched 90% of the matches. I think I took a nap at one point. Because <laughs> they were so early. Casual. Casual. They, they were so early for us because it, it was set in Amsterdam. So it started at like 7, 8 a.m. Both days here. So well, on Sunday when I woke up at seven a.m., the championship series was about to start. Yeah, 
So um, the prize pool was $125,000, played in Amsterdam. Um, I think everybody that's going to see it has seen it. So the results, first place went to Flipside Tactics. So they're, they're an EU team. They won 50000 uh, bucks. Last season, the last big tournament, they actually made to the finals and then ended up losing. So it was kind of cool to see them win this time. Well, what really made me smile was um, they got knocked down to the losers bracket on Saturday yeah. mm-hmm. by Mock at Aces. Yeah, and then they make it back to the championship and have to play Mock at Aces. Yeah, that's exactly what happened last year too. They went down to the losers bracket, still made it to the finals, and then lost. And so the, this time they went through the losers bracket, made it to the finals, and then pulled through. And for those who don't know, the incredible thing about that is when they went to the losers bracket. It's a best of seven series in the championship, but since mm-hmm. they already had a loss, they had to win two consecutive best of sevens to win. Yeah, oh. yeah because the first best of seven put the 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 other team into the technically into the losers bracket since it's double elimination. So, <laughs> so they, they had, to had them to twice. They, they do a legit double elim, which they did. <laughs> Those That's were really fantastic. good games too. Those were really good games to watch. And so then, they got that Mocket Esports EU. Uh, $25,000 second place. Third place went to Northern Gaming, another EU team. Uh, they were actually the second seeded team going into it. And they did like almost the worst. <laughs> and then wow. fourth, fourth place went to Take Three, which is a North American team. They got $10,000. They were the fourth seed. So there's four, four teams from each region. They were the fourth seed, the, the underdogs. And they made fourth place overall. Yeah. Nice. They they went up there. They were having fun and smiling, goofing off, knowing that there's no pressure, and they ended up playing really well and knocking out some good teams and stuff. So how's money, baby? Uh, hard. Yeah, that uh, that reminds me of Wings Gaming and TI. You know, they they chose techies at one point. You know, just mm-hmm. just literally throwing throwing money away, saying, "Yeah, we're just here. We're having fun. We've got way farther than than we expected to." They go on to win the international. <laughs> that's awesome and then so um, in in game actually in the, in the training the training uh the free play map that all the names of the winners are on the little banners around the side of the stadium in game oh really yeah they did that last year for him too that's pretty cool i didn't even realize that happened yep and then there was a little drama afterwards as well oh yeah yeah so mocket esports apparently it approached a couple of the teams or players um, at that event, trying to sign them onto Mocket Esports. While their team is currently competing well, yeah. and finished second place. That seems yeah. like a dick move. Yeah. So they approached Flipside Tactics and already signed from an organization. They've been with them since the beginning of Rocket League. They approached them with contracts. So then um, one of the players of Flipside Tactics posted a video of them taking that market contract and he threw it directly into the fireplace <laughs> and then put a thumbs up at the end. So Nice. I'm sure the guys from Mocket will yeah. land teams, though. Yeah, and then, then they, uh, the players that were playing for Mocket no longer are, are their team. Oh, yeah, I beat you to the they, on that. They, which they did clarify was on good terms. They just couldn't settle on their contract details for the next term or something. but. So, so we'll see. Man, you can say Hell. good terms all you want to save well, face, yeah. but if your employer is already looking for someone else, <laughs> it's like a double barrel middle finger right to them. I'm walking. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Them. And it's also possible, too, that they were just going to have another team, like two EU teams or something, because they've done that before. That's a pretty but common still, thing in esports where you know, yeah. you've know you got the capital raised and you mm-hmm. want to double your chances of winning or at least you know make it up in other regional tournaments. So you know you create... LGD Young Blood, or wh- whatever they're calling themselves. <laughs> yeah. Also, there was something I wanted to point out about the Dota one that I just remembered. Thanks for bringing that back up. I noticed the prize pool for the winner actually dropped a little bit, and the prize for the first round of eliminators out of the uh, final events was raised. So the winners lose a hundred thousand dollars off of what it has been the last few non-TI majors. But the first round out guys gain $15,000 per team that's knocked out. 
And I thought that was actually really important for Dota to do to help make this more um, financially stable. Yeah. If you have too much going to the winners, there's too much pressure on win or the team disbands. Yeah, with this, you know, as long as you're placing, uh, you can have enough money to it, at the very least, continue your organization. Um, and, you know, this it's no secret that Valve has been actively hiring uh, economists and not like people that, you know, know how the, the wow auction house, auction house works, but like legit, I went to college and I majored in economics and I, I you know, can run the Federal Reserve types of economic <laughs> people. Uh, just to, you know, it, one, balance the economics of the virtual world, you know, the, the TF2 trading scene, if you get into that, it's incredible. There's entire science, there's like spreadsheets on how you can make money by playing Team Fortress 2. Uh, it's not easy. You've got to spend, you know, 60 hours a week doing it. Um, but, you to know, make 100 bucks. Yeah, to make 100 bucks. Uh, but with, uh, with TI, especially with the winnings, I'm sure they're leveraging those guys. Yeah, the TI prize pool is just crazy for an eSport. <laughs> I've, I've got it's the nice. Rocket League question for you, Adam. Sure, so sure. With this recent drama, considering the, the rosters and, you know, team or uh, organizations trying to poach teams up on stage, um, how, how are the developers handling this? Are they doing the Valve thing of where they just throw their hands up and go, well, that's esports? Or are they doing the, you know, the Blizzard thing of where uh, you can't do anything unless you clear it with the big Blizzard uh, or somewhere in the middle? Um, I don't think Cyanix really has anything to do with the teams and their orgs directly. I mean, the scene is still so early. Every season, the teams shuffle. There's a, always a big roster shuffle. Um, I think it's going to take a little while for there to be an, that kind of stability and for them to get that involved with it. But yeah, okay. it's very much a valve approach right now where let this thing come into its own and what happens happens. All right. The difference is valve in that game has enough to it where valve could lock in, say you have an entire year contract every year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think so the majors are doing it a, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What valve does for, for majors and for TI is they've got, um, roster lock dates where they say, hey, everything can shuffle up until this point, uh, and then it can't anymore if you want to get in. Which I, I think is a pretty even way to do it. Uh, and then, you know, they, they let other people put on their own tournaments. So, you know, if, yeah. if you want to go up to up to the, you know, the hour in uh, Amateur Dota 2 League, you can. <laughs> yeah, and get flamed the entire way. No, thank you. <laughs> hey, hey, AD2L is actually a pretty nice league to play in, to be fair. So do you guys see anything from the uh, PlayStation Experience Conference that Sony had this weekend? I did not. Well, okay, I take that back. I saw one thing. We all saw one thing, and well, everyone oh, lost yes. well, we'll, we'll get to one thing. <laughs> I think for me, I, there was like three big takeaways. Um, this is the third year they've done it. Um, they've announced uh, Gran Turismo. Um, what was it? Gran Turismo Sport. I think it was. It's going to be coming out next year. 4K HDR support. Something that caught my eye, though. Select cars will have VR supports. Neat. That's really cool. That's that so is cool. Really cool. <laughs> so you'll be playing Gran Turismo through the fucking windshield. That's awesome. Oh God. That's so cool. I can't even imagine you're sitting there in your Lamborghini with your VR headset on oh, and, yeah. and you've got the VR screen in front of you and you're, you're sitting in your McLaren inside of VR and then you take it off. You're like, wow, I've just got this shitty Lamborghini. I wish I had a McLaren. So you put the VR headset back on. <laughs> I want to know how many people buy Gran Turismo that have a VR thing that end up buying a racing wheel. They didn't have one. <laughs> Dude, I'm not going to lie. That'd be worth it. Get a force feed. I totally would. At that point, you're already so close. You might as well buy the racing wheel. And better be force feedback. Yeah. Yeah. But no, oh, I watch. totally would. So it's only select I don't cars. Even like racing games. The yeah. select cars will be like the Volkswagen Jetta and like yeah. the uh, Chevy Cobalt and things like that. You won't be able to get into the Vets and the Lambos and stuff like that, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would the, suck. You, the, the Ford Pinto will be perfectly modeled on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the, the, the extreme Honda Accord. 
Yeah. Complete with a full ashtray with gum wrappers and <laughs> six and disc CD fingers. trailer or trader. Yeah. Or player. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Monster Energy great. Drink can behind the front seat. <laughs> Ah, so the other big announcement they had, um, I don't know if you guys have played them before, Dishonored. Uh, Dishonored, or, sorry. Yeah, Dishonored. Dishonored. My God, I am off today. Uncharted, Lost Legacy. (laughs) I have not. I haven't played any of them. I know they're all really good, but I haven't played any of them. So this is going to be forking off of a character introduced in um, Uncharted 2, but they showed what seems to be gameplay. The thing is, yeah. this gameplay looks gorgeous. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, until they go and do like some camera things where you're looking and picking locks. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was very easy to confuse it with cinematics. But even when they were doing mm-hmm. that, the graphics looked the same. Yeah. The only thing that cued you at not being cinematics was that's a very first person pl- or a player esque thing to do where you look right, look left before you cross yeah. this. So that it was... must be getting easier for developers to pull that kind of stuff off. I, I know on in the PS3 era, I only saw it once, and that was with Metal Gear Solid 4, where there's this big cutscene, and you know, in Kojima fashion, you you know sit down with your bucket of popcorn, you watch a two-hour cutscene, and Snake just stood there in the middle of this dusty field, and I'm like, what's going on? Where's the rest of the cutscene? And then the HUD fades in. And you're like, oh <laughs> shit, oh shit! It was gameplay the whole time. Yeah, well, I like that about Metal Gear Solid because a lot of those cutscenes you can just look around with the right analog stick in the middle of the cutscene and stuff because it's an end game. Well, I was also going to say it wasn't Metal Gear Solid Four just a big fucking cutscene. Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was some gameplay. Every Metal Gear, every Metal Gear has got like it's 30 like minutes. half and half. 30 minutes of the best gameplay you've ever experienced, and then like 12 hours of the best movie you've ever seen. <laughs> so, Uncharted, did it look cool though? Did the concept look cool? Um, I mean, it looks like it's going to be a typical kind of Uncharted, though mm-hmm. with Nathan Drake, there's always guns and explosions and stuff. But with this woman, it was very not anything blowing up until the very end when she had to fight some people. Mm-hmm. But it looks like an Uncharted game, which makes it look pretty solid. Yeah. I mean, I've played around with the first one a little bit. I've watched second. I can't remember if I've watched any of the third, but it looks good game. Yeah. Um, it's it's Uncharted. They they couldn't have ended the series, right? It prints money. <laughs> well, supposedly the fourth <laughs> one ends it in a very, like, this is the end of the Drake saga. Yeah. yeah. But a game that I'm glad is not done was also released. And this is the one I think most people are ready for. I'm already ready. The Last of Us the first. Part 2. So I haven't even played the first one. I, I did watch like the intro of the first game that like pulls your heartstring and blows your mind. Oh, and yeah. I, I have to play the first game, but I saw the trailer for the second. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, I really have to play the first yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, you can borrow mine. I, I totally will. I totally will. <laughs> it's, it's a good game. So I'm so excited for this. The Last of Us is one of my favorite games of all time. So, so how much have you guys looked into the trailer? Um, yeah. I just saw the one little trailer where it shows Ellie there playing a guitar, singing, and then she says something about she's not going to stop until she kills every last one of them. Yeah. So... Um, so for yes. <laughs> people who don't know what or haven't seen the trailer, the camera comes in and there's this big Firefly logo on a stop sign outside this house. You get inside, there's dead bodies everywhere. Ellie's covered in blood and is just playing a fucking guitar because she has gone full psychopath at this point. <laughs> um, the baddest of badasses. Joel walks in kind of beat up. And asks her if she's really going to go through with it. And she says she won't stop until she kills them all. Now, there's some theories going around that Joel is actually dead. And that she's talking to a memory and or she's really fucking lost it. Because who could grow up fighting zombies your entire life and still be sane? Oh, that's interesting. 
Oh, that would be a fucking twist. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't play as Joel. I think they've confirmed Ellie is the playable. Okay. That's kind of what I assumed from the trailer, but you never know. So, yeah, I'm ultra excited. That ending was one of my favorite endings I've ever seen. It was just yeah. such a jarring ending. The whole game had moments like that all throughout. But at the very end, though, I mean, I didn't see it coming. I didn't. Mm-hmm. They're talking, 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 and then I just lost my shit. <laughs> it's pretty much how that went. And, and we, yeah. will, we will have a spoiler cast in the future after I play through it. Oh, we have to. Yeah. Spoiler cast. The problem with that is, though, is you're going to play through it, and then we're going to be talking about it, and then I'm going to have to play it again for the <laughs> third time. <laughs> oh, shucks. God forbid. I was actually going yeah. through on the hardest difficulty trying to uh, go completely like stealth on that. Yeah. The Dude. hardest one, like after you beat the game that you unlock? Or yeah, like, like where you can't see. So, Oh, you can't use the... There's yeah. a mechanic in the game when you first play through it that um, allows you to kind of see enemies through walls. It's called listening, and you would listen to an enemy, and it would show you, hey, this is where this enemy is. Well, on the top difficulty, they say, well, fuck you. You're playing this for real. We're taking this away. Oh, so I was lucky enough. I was playing it fresh, like right after I just beat it. So I'd remembered Mm -hmm. a lot of it because I ran through that game really fast. Yeah. But without that, it would be really, really, really rough. Yeah. I didn't play it on that difficulty, but I did play it on the hardest one you could play upon, you know, at the beginning. And it really adds to the experience because it's such a, because um, it's such a, a survival-based game. That lack of resources really helps the the mood. Yeah, it really, it really does. You don't uh, get the ammo as much. Makes you have to do the stealth stuff. Pick up a lot more items. Kind of throw them to distract them more. Kind of like Metal Gear esque, how you have to kind of distract guards. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so, so go ahead, Adam or Tom. We'll, we'll we'll talk a bit more about that when uh, when we see some more, and we'll definitely have a spoiler cast when I play through it uh, eventually. Um, I do want to do want to tell you that um, yeah, there's some been some VR news, uh, two different things in VR. I'll cover the nice one first, and then we'll get to the drama because you know that's what you people want, isn't it? Um, so HTC has decided to spin up their own publishing arm, their own VR studio, um, to essentially bring deeper, better games to the Vive. Uh, now, it, it's no secret that uh, on Oculus and Vive and Cardboard and PSVR and all these VR platforms, the vast majority of the games that come out have been getting uh, you know, panned for being you know, they're really cool. They're amazing. There's these great immersive experiences Mm -hmm. that last about an hour and then they go away because they're, they're just tech demos They're just developers trying stuff out, seeing what sticks, seeing what people enjoy doing. The big in-depth VR games just don't exist right now. Probably the, I don't even know what the biggest, longest VR game would be at this point, but there's not very many. Vanishing Realm or Fantastic yeah. Contraption? Yeah. And Fantastic Contraption is just shit. I hated that game. Oh, get out of here. I hated it. It was terrible. Where's your but inner Vanishing engineer, Realms, man? My inner engineer, because what I did... Is, okay, Fantastic Contraption, for those who don't know, is you have sticks and you can make them varying lengths and wheels and stuff, and you've got to get a ball to a point. And you build a Fantastic Contraption to do that. But the only thing I did is just make the sticks longer and make the thing drive off into the cliff. But the sticks were so long, the ball hit the exit anyway. Um, I feel like I was cheating through the whole game. There, there wasn't any rhyme or reason to it. And it's too hard to line stuff up because you're always cockeyed a little bit and the shit just walks off into the sunset without you. It's, I did not like it. I played probably... 30 minutes to an hour of that game and I gave it up. Well, that's part of the design concepts when it got wobbling out of control is you add more shit to stabilize it. People don't no, it say, was- oh, this car with two wheels is a little rough. <laughs> Fuck it, let's just keep building on it and go. 
it wasn't that though. It was it was because it was because I couldn't I couldn't ever get the thing perfectly level. It wasn't that the design was wrong, so it was wobbly. It was that it was the lack of control. If I could like stick this to an axis and get like degrees of, of separation between the pieces, that would be great. But they don't give you anything like that. So you've got to eyeball the whole thing and when it's all fucked up, you just gotta live with it. That's that's why I hated it. But it does get substantially harder after about an hour or two. Okay. That's you start having to build things that can climb and things like that, which are it's really interesting. You have to make like tank tracks and stuff like that. Uh, or treads. That's cool. That sounds interesting. So also in the so we'll we'll see what uh, what games HTC ends up publishing out of that. Their entire objective is to do bigger, better, feature length VR games, uh, which I'm I'm really really looking forward to. Um, there has been some VR drama though. Uh, have you guys seen the trailer for Arizona Sunshine? Uh, had, do you remember the original Vive trailer where they had that zombie game? No, I haven't seen anything on that. What is it? Um, so Arizona Sunshine uh, is, and I'm, I'm going to to bring this up real quick. So give me just a second. Mm-hmm. Oh, one more thing I forgot to uh, throw out there while you're digging that up. Um, the HTC Studios, they have said that they don't plan on putting up barriers like the um, Oculus, where they will not quarantine their games off from other VR platforms. They said they're not, they not going to be building them initially to be able to support it, but they are not going to put any roadblocks to prevent it from the future, and that if the desire comes, they will build it later. That's good. That's, That's wonderful. really good, yeah. They know Oculus loves their DRM. They love to lock down their platforms. Uh, and you know, Steam's Open VR specifically is built to make it run on anything. Uh, so Arizona Sunshine uh, was sort of teased from uh, the Vive's first trailer, uh, and it's one of the games that was on my wish list for a long time. I was really looking forward to it because it's such a simple concept. Here's a shit ton of guns. Here's the old West. Here's zombies. Go have fun. And you just murder zombies constantly. Um, just it, it looks like it would play great in VR. Uh, sadly, uh, what happened is the developers somewhere along the lines ended up partnering with Intel uh, to you know, get more funding, add more content to the game. Why Intel's getting into this, who knows. Uh, but they ended up blacklisting two game modes from everyone who wasn't running uh, a recent i7 gen processor. Uh, now, usually you would do that sort of thing for performance reasons, saying, okay, well, this is really physics heavy, or this takes, you know, this minimum required number of frames. Um, and, you know, you would show a warning and say, look, we don't think your system specs have, have met the minimum requirements. Uh, and some Steam games will do that. Some Steam games will say, well, look, your play space is too small. You can play it, but you're probably going to have a bad time. They just decided to blacklist it completely. Here's the catch. It wasn't for performance reasons. The developer got on the Steam forums and said, oh yeah, we, we had an exclusive with Intel for just the i7s. Uh, we were going to release these game modes to everyone here in a couple months. Shady as fuck. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> guessing the community had something to say about that. Oh, oh no doubt, yeah. I bet. So they got they got flooded with Steam refunds. Everyone who could refund did. Uh, everyone else emailed Valve to try to get refunds out of it. Um, there were uh, an absolute flood of one star reviews because the developers were pieces of shit. Um, there were threads on Reddit. There were threads on Hacker News. There was uh, game stories, uh, just flooding everywhere blasting these guys so arizona sunshine don't give them a dime of your money uh, the developer did or, well let me let me put this out there uh there is a cool little tool that allows you to run oculus games on the vive it's a tool called revive the developer said wow fuck those guys and made a patch to arizona sunshine to unlock the mode for everyone um <laughs> eventually the developer did come back and say yeah because you guys are so angry uh, we're just going to give everyone the game mode. They didn't apologize. They didn't say what they did was wrong, but they 
absolutely were locking out features for no reason whatsoever. People with uh, i5 processors and you know lower spec i7s uh, did test the game to see if there was a performance issue. There wasn't. Everything ran smooth as butter on everything. It's just shady practice by an indie to get money from Intel. Yeah, so fuck them, and they're not seeing a dime of my money. This game was on my wish list for a long time. It's really something I was looking forward to, but they can fuck off. That's crazy. Yeah, that really, really, really sucks. But what can you do? Damn indie sometimes. So next is we, um, we're we planning on talking about a video game design that often is overlooked. Um, you have your general music soundtracks. Those get noted recently. Doom winning best music with their heaviest shit album. But um, <laughs> what we were planning on talking about is something more um, subtle. It's adaptive music and game design. Something that helps you kind of get immersed that you don't necessarily notice, but it is definitely there. And I think Adam has a little bit more information on that for you guys to start us off. Oh, yeah, for sure. So adaptive music, um, you can kind of break it off into two categories. So you've got dynamic music, which is, you know, you have a song for um, song for this level. And then once you get past this area, then it starts the song for this next level or something like that. Um, or boss battle music, and you know, specifically is a good example of this. And then you have adaptive music, which is music that is changing or controlled by the gameplay itself, the things that you do specifically. Um, a really good example of this is in Portal 2. When you're playing through the the gel levels, you'll notice that you know you're the the music is playing the whole time, but as you you run across the orange gel, it adds that extra layer to the music and it speeds up or whatever. And if you bounce on the blue blue gel, it adds that other element to the music. Um, these things are really cool and interesting. Um, I'd like to see more games use more creative ways to do this. You can also see in Portal 2, if you use the laser redirection, mm -hmm. as the lasers are firing, especially with multiple lasers, they'll actually add their own tones to the music. And as more lasers are firing, they'll be slightly differently toned or, or tuned to, to make yeah. a chorus when you get everything working properly really cool those small atmospheric ones are really really cool oh yeah. i love it it gets you in the zone and it, it helps you with the puzzles because if it sounds wrong if the music stops you know you've left the rails you know you're not quite right. on the right track yeah but if if things you know start sounding harmonious mm -hmm. you're doing something right yeah and even if you're not conscious of that as you're playing it it still even subconsciously can can give you that that sense of confirmation that you're doing something right. Even if you don't notice it, it's still effective. Yeah. Or in the case of like black where um, each person shooting at you would have a different pitch. Once you start hearing those cords of guns, you know, you're in a bad fucking spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was so cool. I didn't get to play as much black as I wanted, but uh, the sound was definitely one of the better mechanics in that game. Mm -hmm. So what they were doing in that game is the designers decided that rather than having one gun modeled to one sound, they would actually have each enemy have their own pitch. So if you have three people shooting AKs, they would actually be at three different pitches. So they would actually be able to make chords out of the people shooting at you. And the more and more people they had shooting at you, the more and more it built on itself. So when you mm -hmm. got into big firefights, the weapons yeah. would all be at different pitches. That's cool. It, it was really subtle. You wouldn't notice it as much. But when you're in a big event, I mean, A, you're caught up in the action, so you wouldn't notice it. But if you stopped and actually paid attention a little, you would kind of notice, like, those don't sound normal. Yeah. It was just really cool. And that game was a bitch. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, of events um, changing the, the soundtrack... Uh, Dota 2 actually does this to a certain extent. It's not quite as dynamic as Black, uh, but in Dota 2, 
uh, what happens is you'll be in lane, you'll be farming, you'll be just doing normal stuff to kind of beef up your character, get ready for the late game or the mid game where you're going to be fighting people more often. Um, if you decide to gank someone, the battle music will change. And, and you know, as you're trying to attack the person, the, the battle music will get more intense. And it'll be like, yeah, you're getting them, you're winning. But if they decide to go on you, if you're getting attacked, if your lane is getting pushed in, the music will change slightly to be like, oh shit, it's all going down. You better live through this one. Um, it, it gets even deeper than that. So if you decide to smoke, which is an item that turns you know, uh, your team within a certain area invisible, the music will get nice and quiet and, and pretty sneaky. And, and then uh, you know, when, when you all pop out of it to attack the enemy, everything rises again. It's a really cool effect because when you're playing it and you're all smoked up and you're sneaking through the woods, it's, everything's all sneaky, it puts you in the mood. Yeah. Just the mood to stab someone in the back when they're least expecting it. And it also has a really cool thing called crowdsourcing, where when you're doing really bad, you get to hear everyone bitch. And when you're doing really good, you get to hear everyone flame. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's, the Dota community is really effective when it comes to bitching and flaming. It's some of the best <laughs> bitching and flaming I've seen in any game ever. That choir of bitchery is just the best in the business. It's so <laughs> intense. And, and sometimes, sometimes you just want to die afterwards. It's great. Wow. Yes. So... so- so the mu- uh, the music can change in regarding to the, the the what's happening in the games, but also sound effects can be done the same way. So uh, a realistic example that's not necessarily creative, but like you know, in a shooter, if you're firing your gun in the, in an open open area, it sounds normal, and then you walk through a, a kind of a tight tunnel area and you shoot, you can hear that you can hear the sound bouncing off the walls. It sounds like you're in a tunnel or if you're playing and you go underwater, all of a sudden you can't hear the environmental noises as much. Or they do that fuzzy noise where it sounds like water rushing over your ears in the back, blurring whatever noise that was going on elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Um, that that could be really effective, too. Absolutely. That Wind Waker actually used something uh, with sound effects. Whenever you got into a battle, every sword strike uh, had this you know, uptick in the music, this, this uh, mini crescendo almost. Uh Uh, And it, it actually melded with the battle music. So they would have this nice low beat going in the background of battle music. Mm -hmm. uh, And then every hit would be one of those high points. And one of those major beats of the song was really cool. And it got you really into it. Uh, And on top of that, it made the whole thing seem like a, like an action moment in a Disney movie, both with the the sound and the graphics and just the way everything blended together. That's awesome. Well, that game was all about the art because that one really brought the stem cell or stem cell shading. Holy shit. But the cell (laughs) shading. (laughs) Now that's some new technology we need to explore. (laughs) But yes, you know what I'm talking about. The cell shading technology up to the forefront. Stem cell shading. Stem cell shading, making those babies look good one cell oh, yeah. at a time. <laughs> I've already got the marketing. Let's do it. Well, then you also have some games, um, even older, uh, like uh, Super Mario 64, where like Dire Dire Docks, yes, where um, water level influences. So I know yeah. Tom played a lot of that. Did you ever play much of that one, Adam? No, I didn't. Dire Dire Docks was great. So they had like the dry land areas and they had the underwater areas. As soon as you get uh, to a certain spot in the level, they add like a little bit of drums in the background just to give it a little bit more beat. Mm-hmm. And there was an area with enemies. So it, it totally changed the way it felt. Uh, it was really cool. They did that with a couple areas. Hmm. Something I thought was really unique for a game. Um, it wasn't quite like that, but what you did influence the music a ton was a uh, braid. They had the yes. level where your X coordinate in the game influenced the time, not only of where the enemies were, but where the music was. Yeah. So by walking backwards, played the music backwards by walking forward, played it forward. I think it was also tied to your speed. Yes. I yeah. want to say. Mm-hmm. So they did know, that really interestingly at the very end sequence of the game too. Because you go through the one way and the music's playing and it's super epic and then you get to the little end thing and then all of a sudden you have to rewind the whole thing and it plays all the music backwards through the whole thing. But it still sounds like it goes with it. It's cool. They did that really well. 
Yeah, and it, it also, you know, the the sound in Braid, especially with that level, if they didn't have that, mm-hmm. imagine, you know, it would just be just a little bit harder, but still harder to grasp what was actually happening in the level. Because yeah. people people know stuff sounds weird, like it sounds a certain way when played in reverse, and if, most everyone has heard something played in reverse. Yeah. Um, so just hearing the music go backwards when you move backwards, it instantly clicks. Oh. Mm-hmm. I'm manipulating time when I walk to the left. Okay, yeah. I get it now. Yeah, especially if you didn't see one of those little head dudes, you wouldn't really know except for that audio cue. Exactly. Right. So uh, Banjo-Kazooie did this, speaking of older games that did this. Um, in the overworld of Banjo-Kazooie, when you're in like the witch's lair, there's always like this almost fairy tale esque witch music playing in the background. Um, but you would get to an area where you could enter a level and the music would dynamically shift to accommodate it. So there was like an, an ice level um, and you would walk into the, the room right before you could go into the ice level. And this like witch's music would turn a little Christmassy and get some, get some jingle bells in the background and stuff like that. It was mm-hmm. really cool. And they did it on the fly. It was, you know, just one music track fading into the other. It, it really, really helped bring the world together. Crossfading. Um, my most noticeable thing of that would be like GTA. Um, yes. Three. Whenever you would jump out of a car, you would hear the radio radio and all of a sudden just kind of go off in the distance as you left the car behind. And then the rest of the environment would just kind of blur in. Yeah. Some of the later GTA games, um, you know, some of the gangs would listen to particular radio stations very loudly. So if you walked by a car, if a car drove past you and it was playing a certain station really loud, like heavy bass, like, oh, shit, this gang is in this area. Would that be oh, San Andreas? Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was pretty rad. Um, and then- Zelda... It, always did the crossfading to a certain extent with their battle stuff, but it, it's yeah. not super noticeable or, or super rememberable. Notable. Yeah. 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 I think the most rememberable one, especially early for me, it really caused a Pavlonian condition for me. Um, Sonic two. It's not yeah. as well polished as some of the others, but when you're underwater and you haven't hit one of those air bubbles in a minute, you start hearing that all of a sudden everyone you just tense your hands instantly sweat you yourself start holding your breath and you're like where the fuck is the air bubble at i as a kid nothing i induces, used to have nightmares yes nothing music. induces more anxiety than the sonic 2 drowning sound oh my god so so if i if i were in like a pool or if i were scuba diving and i started to hear that music i would freak the fuck out Tom will end up dying uh, scuba diving because someone played Sonic 2 right behind yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. I've I've actually gone to YouTube and listened to that. Just sitting here, YouTube, listen to the drowning Sonic song, and I and I noticeably feel more tense and anxious and I like I, I already feel the way I felt trying to play through Sonic 2 and getting really far into the level and then getting too far down into the underwater part and no oh, no there's no air bubbles it's it's all gone. And you see I, Sega oh if Sega didn't go <laughs> under they would be controlling us right now because they were experts yeah. at the Pavlovian response. Oh, yes. And I think that's actually a really good mark of audio design is when you hear this it's not just a, oh, I know this is happening, but it's like, a, oh, mm-hmm. shit, I react to this music. So, yeah. so if I say yeah. exclamation point to you guys, what's the first sound effect that pops into your head? Boing! Yep. <laughs> Followed by a cardboard box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, there was a, in Metal Gear Solid 2, there was a part that scared the hell out of me with that. Because you're in that, there's this huge room and it's all these soldiers. They're all, it's, they're watching this video. It's like a big conference kind of thing. And you're you're kind of like navigating through, but if one sees you, they all turn around, and you get that oh sound for everybody in that room, which is probably seventy people in that room, <laughs> and it's just this explosion of oh! <laughs> is that that room when you're like in the back, and it looks like they're all just kind of at attention, looking forward towards the room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's early into the game too. Metal Gear did uh, did a lot of the uh, I, I'd call it you know the dynamic soundtrack <laughs> stuff where. You know, someone sees you and then 
the music you know hits this this high tempo and it, it yeah, really it ramps really up. tense um and and you have to you know survive and then then you you leave the alert phase right so they know something's up but they don't see you and then the music just it gets low and quiet mm-hmm. but really tense and you're you're sitting there in your cardboard box or in your locker and you're looking out and you're like oh shit oh shit mm-hmm. oh shit and the music is just like bearing down on you my yeah. favorite part was uh metal gear solid 3 snake eater just with that soundtrack and the way the music blended into each other oh it was so good and what's cool is a lot of times when they do that it's like it's all part of the same chord progression or same melody with just things changed about it to make that melody or chord progression sound more or less intense. Well, that's like uh, the biggest example. Yeah. The biggest example of this is probably red dead redemption. So if you haven't watched, there's a little bit of uh, explaining of how they made the soundtrack in the, did you know gaming video on that? So all of the music in red dead redemption is at 130 beats per minute in the key of A minor. So what this means... <laughs> so, much, so much discipline right there. What this yeah. means is they can make a bunch of different layers, and they all will be interchangeable, and they all work with each other because they're in the same key at the same tempo. So if you're in one area, it might play you know, layers 1, 5, and 10. And then, oh, you're in this combat place, or you're getting attacked in that same area. Oh, okay. So that adds in layer number 14 and 15 and the music gets more intense, but it's the same, the same mood, the same feel. It all works together. It's one big cohesive soundtrack. And that was really interesting to me. That's wonderful. When I first heard that, it was really amazing. What stuck out is how they would have certain events, kind of like in typical games, events would trigger Mm -hmm. certain things. Yeah. But it wasn't done like normal games. Like you said, you could layer with this. So if there was already yeah. something playing, you jumped on your horse. They added in one of the horse lines, which you were describing some of them were more bass driven. Yeah. They'd try to give the simulate the horse riding. So like mm-hmm. it would just layer in your it goes right on top of the existing music. It's so it's just, cool. And that's a Perhaps. game that I never really thought about the soundtrack until you had pointed that out. Yeah. It's yeah. it just that good. It, it Red Dead Redemption is one of the the games with the best game feel to it because you pop that disc in and you are part of the Wild West. You are that character. <laughs> and it just everything um really was cohesive. Uh there is a, a minor game and a little minor moment that I'd like to add. Uh in Crypt of the Necro Dancer, and that said, this is this is really easy to do with this game because there's one song playing in a level at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you get close to a shop, the shopkeeper is singing. It's like doing this opera singing of the song you're listening to. So <laughs> when you get close to the shop, but you're not in it, you can sort of hear some guy in the background like belting out the notes of this song. And then you get in the shop and he's just like going all out, like full <laughs> opera, screaming the song as loud as he can. And it That's really cool. gets you into it. It is so That's awesome. That's awesome. I still never played that. Oh, yeah, you should. We, it's we a couple need to pick blocks. that up and play it. It's, it's a lot of fun. I'll pick that up, and then you guys can pick up 140. Yes. Same kind of thing. All right, so I think that's about all we have for this week. But I think Adam stumbled upon something If for all you have Amazon Prime accounts. Yes. So if you have Amazon Prime, if you don't watch games on Twitch, uh, you, get kinda, you get benefits from that. It's called Twitch Prime. Uh, you get like a, a channel subscription each month for free. You can subscribe to your favorite person or whatever. And there's there's other perks associated with that as well. So this one is a free game. Telltale, The Walking Dead. Season 1 is free if you have Amazon Prime. All you have to do is log into your Twitch thing, link it with your Amazon account, download the game, play the game. So I'm definitely going to be playing through this. I think you guys have played some of it already, haven't you? Yes. Yes, I've gotten through the fourth chapter. Mm. I have not finished it. Have you finished it oh. yet before, Tom? Oh, really? Really? Wow! I'm the only one who's finished something. Yes, I win. Yes, I have. Uh, I have played through season one. Uh, I have played through uh, season two up to the fourth chapter. 
uh, but I have not finished season two. Uh, and it's if you haven't played this game, uh, especially if you've got Prime, uh, you know, go check this out. And even if you don't, it's pretty cheap. You can even, you know, if you've got an iPad laying around, you can buy it on Google Play, on the Apple uh, App Store, Steam. Uh, it works just about everywhere. It is one of the most interesting adventure games I've played in a very long time. So definitely pick this up free, if not free. The mobile platforms is actually cheaper than the Steam platform. Uh, but we will all of us be playing through this game again and we will be talking about it on the 23rd in full details with spoilers and all at the end of our podcast so we will warn you don't worry yes (laughs) but if you'd like to listen in just go ahead and pick up this game for free and um email us in some talking points you'd like or some things you thought about the game and um we can bring those up in conversation and we all have fun talking about it play with us us. let us join us let us know how many times you cried during The Walking Dead Season 1. <laughs> Cry I think, count. I think my record for lowest number of sobbing fits was 17, maybe 18. <laughs> I wow. will say there's definitely some emotional attachment that I didn't feel mm-hmm. for another game until The Last of Us. Crazy. It's good. It's so good. And then, I'm looking Tom, forward to it. I think you got us a gaming fact for this week. I do. So do you guys know what the longest game in development was the game that took the longest from, Hey, we're going to make a game to wow. It's on the shelves. Well, we know it's not the last guardian though. It took a while. (laughs) It took a while. Well, if, if we're going into the future, the answer is half-life three. It will be released in 2047. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but sometime in the year 2047. uh, And it has been under development the entire time. It will be released on (laughs) uh, the holodeck 360. (laughs) <laughs> and it'll be a pivot point for a 2D platformer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, if we're talking current days without time travel, the longest game in development took 15 years to come out, and it was Duke Nukem Forever. And we uh, we finally learned that you know, just because you wait a long time doesn't make the game any good. Yeah. Yeah, that game bombed hard, didn't it? Oh, yeah. It was <laughs> one of the biggest bombs of all time. It was a golden situation where everyone thought they loved the character because of, you know, back in the day. And then whenever they got that exact character currently, they realized, fuck, we really, really don't like this guy. Yeah. (laughs) It was was just, it was a bad game. It only took 15 years to figure it out. Yep. Only. Not that long, right? (laughs) So I think that's all we have for you this week. You guys can always uh, send us some email at fanmail at 72pinconnector.com. You could uh, tweet at us at 72PC Podcast. You can catch any of our previous shows at 72 Pin Connector on our YouTube channel. Or you could always check out our webpage at 72pinconnector.com, which will have all of our detail for where you can find us. Or you could always find us on twitch.tv slash 72 Pin Connector, 10 p.m. Eastern Time every Friday for this show nice and live. So, I think that's all we got. So, until next week, game on. See you, everyone. Bye.